This lecture will cover the anatomy and physiology of the hematologic system. The hematologic system includes everything that goes along with our blood. The functions of blood are, uh, number one, transportation of substances, and these substances include oxygen and carbon dioxide. So blood is essential for the oxygenation of our tissues. It's also responsible for the regulation of body temperature, pH, which has to do with carbon dioxide, and fluid balance. It also transports cells that offer the body protection, such as the cells in the white blood cell family. Now, plasma is, is there, well, well, the blood is divided into two sections. There's the cells, which is the solid component of blood, and there's the plasma. And the plasma is what is responsible for the transportation because it's, it's the liquid part, it's what moves. Um, it also contains not just um, water, water is part of it, but it also contains a lot of solids that are dissolved or suspended in this fluid. And most of the substances are plasma proteins. These proteins are synthesized by the liver and they are responsible for a lot of really important functions in our body. First being clotting. All of the clotting factors are considered plasma proteins. Fluid balance, uh, proteins in general, but the most important one being albumin. And then also immunity, our immunoglobulins, our plasma proteins. Um, cell, our human body contains between four and six liters of blood. So uh, it's liquid and 45% of that amount is formed elements. So you're looking at 45% of solids, if you will, and 55% of liquids or plasma, if you will. And we'll talk later about how the hematocrit and that is um, the division between the solid or formed elements and the liquid or plasma. All formed elements in the blood are produced from stem cells in the red bone marrow. And you have red bone marrow in your flat bones, in the irregular bones, and the epiphyses of your long bones. And that's where the stem cells are, and that's where all blood cells are formed. They all come from these same hematopoietic stem cells. Our blood contains three different kinds of cells. The red blood cells are biconcave discs, which means they have little indentations on either side of them. They contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what is responsible for oxygen transportation in our body. They have no nucleus um, and they are produced uh, by our bone marrow, as is everybody, or excuse me, all the other um, cells, cell lines, but their production is stimulated by erythropoietin, and erythropoietin is made in the kidneys. So this is an important connection here between anemia and renal failure, because if your kidneys aren't producing enough erythropoietin, your bone marrow is not going to be able to produce enough red blood cells. In order to produce the red blood cells, uh, your bone marrow needs protein, it needs iron, for the hemoglobin, uh, vitamin B12 is important and folic acid is important. So diet is very important in terms of uh, keeping your red blood cells where they should be and can be a problem with some kinds of anemia, not all, but some kinds of anemia. Red blood cells live for about 120 days. And when they break down, they are phagocytized by the macrophages in the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. Um, hemolysis is, is the destruction of red blood cells. And uh, what happens in hemolysis is all of the um, components of the red blood cells are, are released and um, 
get broken down and excreted from the body in bilirubin. So when you uh, have abnormal hemolysis, abnormal destruction of red blood cells, this increases your bilirubin level and you become jaundiced. The other thing about uh, the red blood cells is that they have, uh, they're involved in ABO blood typing and RH factors. And so um, everyone, and this is um, Mendelian genetics, so go way, way back to uh, your first biology class. Everyone has um, an, a blood type. So you're either A, B, AB, or O. O being the absence of the A factor or the B factor. AB being the presence of both. A could be the presence of two A's or an A and an O. And B could be the presence of two B's, a B and an O. The other thing that goes along with this is your RH factor, which can either be positive or negative. And all of these things have to do with proteins that are included in the blood cells and they loom very large when you want to infuse blood products into someone from a donor or when you want to do a stem cell or a bone marrow transplant or actually a tissue transplant too, come to think of it. Um, so anyway, let's move on to white blood cells. So white blood cells are larger than red blood cells. They do have a nucleus. They're produced in the bone marrow. Um, T lymphocytes develop in the thymus and the T's and the B's proliferate and differentiate in the lymph tissue and um, become different kinds of cells that have different kinds of functions. So the different types of white blood cells are counted in what's known as a differential. So a CBC is a complete blood count. A CBC with differential or diff is when all of the different kinds of white blood cells are also counted. Uh, so included in that would be leukocytes, eosinophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, and all of these different kinds of white blood cells have very different functions. But they all do function in the blood and in the tissue fluid, and they're involved in immune and inflammatory response to injury. So whereas the red blood cells pretty much just hang out in the blood unless there's some problem, the white blood cells uh, are in the blood, but they also move into the tissue fluid uh, in order to uh, provide immune and inflammatory responses for our body. And then finally, the platelets. So platelets are small. They are formed in the uh, red bone marrow as, as are the RBCs. And they are also in, or excuse me, they are involved in the clotting of our blood. And so um, anything that has the prefix thrombo uh, probably has to do with platelets. For instance, thrombocytopenia, something like that. Um, so platelets are important in clotting, white blood cells are important in immune and inflammatory responses, and red blood cells are important in oxygen transport. The hematologic system has a very close connection with the lymphatic system. The lymph system has a series of vessels that run right alongside our blood vessels. There are also series of nodes and nodules that run along various assorted uh, tissue tracts in our bodies. It also includes the spleen and it includes the thymus.
the function of the hem or of the lymphatic system is to return the tissue fluid to our bodies and also for uh, immunity. So when we have um, fluid that comes from back out of our uh, vascular system into the tissue fluid, the lymphatic vessels are responsible for reabsorbing that and returning that to our circulation. Uh, the vessels, that, as I mentioned, the fluid enters through the lymph capillaries. They are just like uh, any other capillary, single-celled little tubes that allow for the movement of fluid and other substances. Uh, below the diaphragm, it, we have um, the left thoracic duct that goes into the left subclavian vein, and then on the right side of the body, the right subclavian vein, and this is a place where the lymphatic system returns fluid. Uh, I mentioned lymph nodes. Nodes are masses of lymphatic tissue that run along the vessels throughout the body, and we have certain collections of lymph nodes, and you'll recall back in your health assessment class, we talked about examining people for the presence of lymph nodes. Um, different lymph chains uh, include cervical, axillary, inguinal, there are, are many others, but those are the ones that are closest to the surface that you can feel if they're enlarged. Um, these lymph nodes house lymphocytes and macrophages, and that's where these cells can um, be sent out into the body to uh, fight various assorted infections or uh, produce an inflammatory response when needed. There are nodules in our mucous membranes, for instance, tonsils and adenoids are lymphatic tissue. And then our spleen, of course, contains um, B cells and T cells. Uh, part of the function of the spleen is to phagocytize worn out red blood cells, as I mentioned earlier, and it also stores platelets. The thymus is responsible for T cells, and uh, the thymus is pretty large in kids, but it atrophies with age. This is a good visual for how your blood breaks down into its components. Uh, fig figure 15.1 in your book uh, illustrates this as well. So the plasma, it, as I mentioned, the main component is water. It also contains proteins. Uh, albumin is the main protein in, in your plasma. It contains nutrients, electrolytes, hormones, and gases. Uh, this plasma plays a really big part in blood clotting because remember plasma proteins uh, or excuse me clotting factors are plasma proteins also plays a big part in your immune system and in the regulation of fluid balance because of all the albumin and the other proteins plasma without the clotting proteins is called serum and so when you get fresh frozen plasma or FFP, that has clotting factors in it. And that's really important as we will see later for people who have uh, problems with clotting. So if you take your, your body here and you break down you know, how much blood there is and all the other body fluids and whatever, that's what the, the little guy in the picture is. And then if you look at whole blood and let's say you spun this down in a centrifuge, then you would look at the percentage by volume of what's contained in your blood. The plasma, as I mentioned, is 55% and the formed elements or the cells are 45%. So um, the white blood cells and the platelets it's really kind of hard to see there, but they form what they call a buffy coat or a little narrow buff colored band just under the plasma. And they are about 1% or less of the total blood volume. So in terms of the numbers of platelets and the numbers of white blood cells, there are much less of them than there are red blood cells. Uh, the red blood cells are the heaviest of the formed elements and they sink to the bottom. They of course also are the largest part of the formed elements. Um, this value or the percentage of cells in a blood sample is known as the hematocrit.
So the hematocrit is the percentage of cells in relation to the volume of blood. So when your hematocrit is low, your percentage of cells is low. When your hematocrit is high, your percentage of cells is high, but it could be high relative to the fact that your percentage of water is low, and that's what happens in dehydration. So what this illustration is telling us is that all blood cells can trace their beginnings to a specific type of bone marrow cell, the stem cell. Stem cells are unspecialized cells that give rise to immature red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So you can see uh, the hemocytoblast or the stem cell up there at the top, and then it becomes either a proerythroblast, red cell, uh, myeloblast, which turns out to be um, certain kinds of right, uh, excuse me, white blood cells, basophil, eosinophil, neutrophil, a lymphoblast, which will turn out to be a lymphocyte, a monoblast, which will turn out to be a monocyte, and a, a megakaryoblast, which will turn out eventually to become a platelet. And all of these come from one single type of cell, and then all of these cell lines differentiate from there. This is a picture of what your bone marrow looks like in cross-section. And um, I want to talk about different factors that may alter the function of your hematologic system. So one of those factors is genetics, because you can have several genetic disorders that can really cause a problem for people. Hemophilia is one of those. Uh, where you are missing certain clotting factors and your blood doesn't clot normally as other people's does. And then sickle cell disease, which is a genetic defect that causes misshapen red blood cells. And this can cause problems uh, with oxygenation, pain, bleeding uh, into joints, uh, dif different uh, kinds of problems because of the shape of the red blood cells. Uh, other problems that can happen, uh, hemorrhage or bleeding. This can happen as a result of surgery, something that was done to try to help you in the first place. Uh, this can happen as a result of trauma. Uh, also, childbirth is a significant cause of hemorrhage and is actually back uh, before babies were born in the hospital and we were able to control this in a... Um, Healthcare setting was one of the main reasons women main reasons women died in childbirth. Anemia is uh, a problem, and there are different kinds of anemia, and they all have different causes. So there's iron uh, deficient anemia or folic acid deficiency anemia, which uh, is a, a I guess of the anemia is probably the most common. Pernicious anemia, which has to do with um, B12, vitamin B12, chronic blood loss, people who perhaps have an ulcer or some sort of a GI malignancy lose blood through their stool and they don't realize they're losing it. Um, a plastic anemia, which we will talk about a little bit later, it's a, a disorder of the bone marrow, and then renal disease, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, has to do with erythropoietin production. Hemolysis is the destruction of red blood cells, and it can come from a transfusion reaction, from a hemolytic anemia, and then there's bone marrow suppression. Bone marrow suppression happens from a lot of different reasons, anti-neoplastic drugs and radi radiation that are given to fight cancer can induce bone marrow suppression. Certain toxic chemicals can be very dangerous to your bone marrow. And then you can also get adverse reactions to drugs. Uh, two that come to mind are diuretics, of a certain kind and certain kind of antiarrhythmic drugs. And these can cause really severe bone marrow suppression. Uh, another 
factor that can alter the function of our hematologic system is a bone marrow abnormality. So something that is a disease in the bone marrow, such as leukemia or multiple myeloma. Some things to keep in mind in your practice if you are taking care of women of childbearing age, because those women are at particular risk for anemia. The average amount of blood loss via menstruation is less than 80 mils, and so normally you don't lose very much. There are, however, people who lose quite a bit more than that because of fibroids and other problems. So how is the best way to estimate this blood loss, both with menstruation and also in a postpartum situation? So a best, better way to estimate uh, blood loss is to count the number of saturated pads or saturated tampon. So if you look at each saturated pad, that is equal to about 50 mils of blood loss and that's how they will count that either uh, in terms of uh, vaginal bleeding for menstruation or vaginal bleeding There are, as I mentioned earlier, some genetic tendencies when it comes to the hematologic system. African Americans have the highest incidence of sickle cell disease. Pernicious anemia is more prevalent among those who have a Scandinavian descent and also among African Americans. And then finally, people of Middle Eastern descent have a genetic predisposition to thalassemia. And so when you're looking at uh, hematologic disorders in, um, or the possibility of them existing, taking genetics into account is a very important thing. Preventing blood disorders is something that is part of our health promotional function as nurses. Talking to people about the danger of exposures to ionizing radiation and harmful chemicals. So uh, besides talking to people, reminding yourself about that and wearing lead aprons when you are in the presence of ionizing uh, radi radiation, such as when you go into maybe CT scan or x-ray with your patients. Um, thinking if you work in um, pe with people of childbearing age, thinking about genetic counseling for those adults who may have such a genetic disorder. So looking at people of certain ethnic descent, seeing if indeed they do have sickle cell um, trait, for instance, and then talking about to them about uh, the possibilities of passing that on to future offsprings. Talking to people about medications that can increase blood disorders. And if indeed uh, they do take something, for instance, Lasix, let's say, that doesn't mean that they're going to have a bone marrow issue. It just means the possibility might exist. So let's teach them to be alert for the signs and symptoms of excessive bruising, easy bleeding, that sort of thing. And then also, depending on... Um, what age group of people you're dealing with suggests that a CBC be checked periodically. For instance, people who are middle-aged and older adults who may be more at risk for certain types of cancers that would cause uh, perhaps an anemia uh, may want to get a CBC checked during their annual physical. So a few other things to keep in mind here in your practice have to do with differential. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in the infection chapter, but just to go over it again here, when you have an increased number of eosinophils in your 
in your diff, that often indicates that you've got an allergy because eosinophils are the white blood cells that are involved in the allergic response. Viral infections prompt the production of more lymphocytes. So when you have more lymphs in your diff, then that means that uh, the possibility of the viral infection exists. And then a bacterial infection stimulates the production of neutrophils. And so you'll get neutrophils and segmented neutrophils, or they call them SEGS. Uh, those two cell lines will be increased in the differential. So finally, here's a couple of interesting things that I'm not sure anybody would ever ask you on a test, but you'll hear these things when you are in clinical practice and it might be nice to know uh, what those are or what people are talking about. So if you have ongoing bacterial infections, this causes immature neutrophils to appear in the blood as bands and that will show up in your diff. Immature uh, forms of segment and granulocytes, excuse me, are called bands. Um, this is referred to as a shift to the left. A shift to the right occurs when there are more mature neutrophils than usual and this occurs uh, when you have anemia from vitamin B12 or a folic acid deficiency. Um, again, just something interesting uh, to note. You'll, you might read this in a physician's H&P or hear this when somebody's presenting a case.